Opposite of me. <laughs> okay, you're fast. I know. Okay. I know. But you're good it's too. good we it's good we have it's good we have him. Um, all right. Well, we spent a long time going through the book of Philippians and we're done. Uh, and I'm sure there would be a ton of things we have not talked about there or could have gleaned that we did not. And Lord willing, at some point somebody will say something about those things. But I really enjoyed it personally. Uh, and so I want to embark on a um, um, a season of going through the book of Judges. We'll start tonight, we'll do an overview, and we'll, we'll sort of talk about the first chapter. Uh, and then once we get into the Judges, I think it'll get a lot more interesting, because they, they really, hey Glenn. Hey, Glenn. Oh, for a second I got nervous. So, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Glenn and Fendi, this is Natalie. <laughs> Hello, that's, that's the baby we had the baby show. That's baby Zion. All right, uh, and so, let me just ask a few questions. I'm gonna hand out some, some handouts, All right. and, uh, and then we're, we're going to read a little bit, and we're going to talk some. All right, so just off, off the top, you know, and if you don't know any, if you can't answer this, that's fine, no problem at all, but just off the top, tell me the, the what's, the where's, the when's, if you know anything about them, of the Book of Judges. Anything that comes to mind about the Book of Judges. Yes, Dan. Uh, it's extremely vague, but uh, they had the, the nation of Israel in the Old Testament had judges before they had kings. Yes, right. And they the judges, judges kind of followed after. What was it after? Was it after uh, immediately after Joshua, when the judges came in? Right. I don't know if it was immediately, but right. So they come in after after Joshua. All right. Anything else? Anything else comes to mind about the Book of Judges? The what? The where? The when of it all? The what? This is after, um, you know, conquest of Joshua, right? Yes. And, uh, you know, the tribes are settling in, and there's no, just like he said, there's no official king. No and official it's, king? It's just uh, kind of like anarchy going on. And everyone's doing their own thing. All right. Everyone, everyone's doing their own thing. And that's going to be a theme. It's be one of the themes. All right. Uh, Anything else about the book of Judges? Yes, Bob? That uh, Caleb didn't seem to get the credit the way that uh, Whitfield didn't get the credit with Whitfield with Edwards, <laughs> and that he had that spirit. Like he was 85 years old, uh, Caleb, and uh, his strength was wearing out, but the Lord gave him that spirit, you know? Yeah, yeah. And we see him in that book, you see? We do, we do. And we know that, that it was only he and Joshua who were over the age of 20 that actually... Uh, went into the promised land from when, from whom came out of the uh, came out of Egypt. So yeah, he was a good and godly man, and God used him greatly. All right, uh, we're, we're talking about the book of Judges, uh, and so so all right. Well, the book of Judges it depicts the life of Israel uh, as they come into the promised land, and they're in the promised land. It would be from the death of Joshua to the rise of the monarchy, the kings. All right, after many years and many battles. Uh, we read in Joshua, chapter 21, verses 43 and 45, and if I gave that to someone, please read it good and loud. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, and not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hands. Not a word failed for any good thing which the Lord has spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. All right, thank you. All right, um, not a word failed of any good thing. And those were the promises that God had made to their ancestors, which he did fulfill. Uh, and God was, God was not giving the Jews uh, Canaan because they were a godly group of people. He was not giving them the land of Canaan because they were a good group of people or in any way a better bunch of people. But rather, he says, because the Canaanites were a wicked people. They were a wicked people. Somebody read Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 4 to 6. Do not think in your heart, after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, because of my righteousness the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. 
but it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before, from before you. It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you, and that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your father, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. All right. Thank you, Mabel. That's pretty amazing because what's happening is that, you know, in Deuteronomy, it's sort of the second Lord's, uh, Moses then, you know, talking to the people who will, who, who will go, who will go, you know, into the land of, uh, you know, and, and, and into the promised land with Joshua. And he's saying, listen, don't think, don't think that you're getting this because you're such a good people. All right. There are two reasons you're getting this. One, because God promised it, you know, he promised this to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also because he's judging all the ites, or seven ites, of the land of Canaan. And we see that all the way back in Genesis 15, when God is promising Abraham he's going to have a seed and he's going to gain the land, but he says it's going to take four generations, or literally like, like 400 years, before the sins of those, of course, of the Amorites, the sins of the Amorites fill up. And then... He would send his people who would be in, uh, uh, they'd be in slavery. He'll send them in. So in other words, he's going to deliver his people and he's going to use them as the tool, if you will, to judge, to judge the, the, the people of, of the land of Canaan for their sin. And so God is using this group to judge this group. All right? And we see that when God judges Israel, uh, the, 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 the northern tribes, with the land of Assyria, and he judges Judah, the southern tribes, through, through the Babylonians. All right? And so he's telling them, don't think that, you know, is, that there's something in you that, that, that you, you've earned this or in somehow I should give this to you because there's something good in you. There isn't anything good in you, actually. All right? And he says, he ends it, he goes, you're a stiff-necked people. <laughs> you know what that means, right? Stubborn. You're stubborn. You're mules. You dig in. You love your sin. You hate righteousness. <laughs> you just, you're, you're stubborn. All right? So he's judging the land of Canaan, and Israel is the instrument that he's going to use. Now... What remained for Israel to do after, after Joshua passes on was to occupy the land and cleanse it uh, from, from the Canaanites uh, that, 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 that they had to destroy them. That, that basically, they get rid of all the Canaanites. They had to destroy all of the Canaanites. They had to rid the land of paganism, what they had to do. But in Canaan, Israel quickly forgets the acts of God. When I say Israel, I mean the people, of course. Uh, and, and that... And, and, and they forget his promises, and they forget his word, which he had established in the land. Uh, and thus, they lose sight of their unique identity as the people of God, chosen by God, called out to, uh, to be his people, to be his army, to be his loyal citizens of his kingdom. And instead, what they do is they attach themselves to the peoples of the land, to Canaan's people. And, and, and they attach themselves to their morals and to their gods and to their religious beliefs and to their practices. And, and they immerse themselves in their social life. And so God punishes them, and he does this over and over again for their frequent apostasy. Uh, and, we see, and we see in the book of Judges, Judges this, these urgent appeals uh, to God in times of crisis. So what's going to happen is the, the people will sin against God. He will judge them in some way because of their sin. They will cry out and beg him for mercy, right? Moving the Lord to have mercy, and he does, and he raises up judges or leaders. When I say judge, don't think of like, like you know, Judge Judy or one of those kind of judges, right? <laughs> a judge meaning like a like a leader, a leader in the land, all right. And through them, through whoever the judge was that he would raise up, they would defeat whoever the foreign oppressor was, and they would restore that area of land back to peace. Now, throughout the book of Judges, the underlying issue is this, the lordship of God over Israel. The lordship of God over Israel. That he is king over Israel, right? And his kingship has been established by a covenant all the way back on Mount Sinai, back in Exodus 19, all the way through 24, right? And it was renewed by Moses on the plains of Moab in Deuteronomy. In other words, the covenant was, I will be your God, I am your God, I will protect you, I will keep you, I will provide for you, nobody will hurt you, you will prosper, right? All of those things I will do for you. But, you. but you must follow me, and you must obey me. And if you go after the foreign gods, 
know then that I will, I will punish you for that. And if you keep doing that, notice that there'll come a point where I'll spew you out. And so this covenant had a, uh, it was two-sided, if you will. All right? God said, I will do these things, but you have responsibility. All right? This is the old covenant. Now we know that no way could, could man keep the old covenant, which is why there had, to be, there had to be a new covenant. And the old covenant is actually pointing to the new covenant, and of course that's in Christ. All right? Christ has done everything. All right, but they're under this covenant, uh, and God is their king, and God is their their ruler. Uh, but they forget that. They forget that. Uh, and so, so this covenant was established at Sinai. It was renewed by Moses in Deuteronomy 29. It was then renewed again or spoken again by Joshua in Joshua 29. Uh, and where Israel should have been following the Lord's words, and they should have been fighting his battles. Uh, and said what they did was they stopped fighting the Lord's battles. They turned to the gods of the land they were in, in the land of Canaan, to, to find security and blessings and, 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 and uh, hope for their flocks and their fields and, and all that other stuff. And, and you know, listen, if, if, you, if you know anything about the gods of those days, you know, and the, the, the different gods of, of like the Philistines and the, the Moabites, they, they had a ton of deities, and each deity was for something. Right? One was for the for, for, for fertility, so you'd have babies. One was for the uh, for the rain, so that you would have rain in the crops. Another one for for the crops themselves that they would grow. Right? They had all these different gods, and, and you know they would they would pray to and do homage to and worship these the, all these you know false deities, which they somehow showed whether they be in wood and stone or whatever. Right? And God hated that. Of course, it's idolatry. It's rank idolatry. Uh, and so so, but that's what they did. They turned from the God who would who had kept them, who had taken them out of bondage, who had blessed them and kept them for 40 years in the wilderness and then brought them into the promised land, and they turned. And you see them turning from as soon as they get into the, to the wilderness, but they turned, right? Uh, and so they had forgotten that the Lord was their king. They had forgotten. And they had abandoned his laws, uh, and they had abandoned living for him. Uh, and, and so we read in Judges 17, 6, in those days, it's an important verse, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Here it is. Derek, did you say this? Yeah. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. All right, so what would we call that today? <laughs> Begins with an A. What was it? Anarchy. Anarchy. If everybody did what was right in his own eyes, we would have lawlessness. We would have I, was also thinking, I was also thinking America. America. <laughs> America, anarchy would be the same thing almost. All right? And so, so everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And five times, five times in the book of, of Judges, we read this phrase. Then the ch children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yes, Bob. I just wanted to back up for a second. This might be helpful that, you know, with that covenant with Adam and the opening up of it more and more, what it is really, it's the Old Testament concealed and the New Testament revealed is when you were going into that. I wanted to say that. But as far as the verse that you were talking about on the righteousness of God, I really, uh, for some reason, was thinking of uh, Jeremiah 23, the Lord is our righteousness. And then in the New Testament, it says, but now the righteousness of God is without the law right. and the prophets in uh, Romans 3.21. And also, uh, I was thinking about... Uh, The Lord, our righteousness, and that basically I hid into that. But uh, I see that word righteousness uh, that I was really looking at a lot today in a study that I did on uh, Romans 3.21 with being justified freely by his grace and looking at that verse 21 and that righteousness I really see here that you, when you read that, Pastor. Yeah, yeah, good. Thank you, Bob. And then also in Hebrews 1.6, it's saying that uh, the Lord loves righteousness and hates wickedness, which you could apply to that. He's a scepter of righteousness, and that's a powerful verse when you look at that Hebrews 1, 6 or 1, 8. Amen. Amen. And, and, and to add to that, uh, without righteousness, without being righteous, I mean, nobody can ever know the Lord. Uh, and, and, we don't, and, and we can't muster that up, and we can't gain it on our own. We, we, it has to be given to us by Christ. We, we need his righteousness. All right. Thank you, Bob. That's good. Yes, John. Pastor Peter, I have a question. Have you ever seen an idol? 
have, I, ever, have I ever seen the like people, a like a the people like, worship? Yeah, you know what? I, I have actually. I was in India doing a bunch of um, doing some evangelistic stuff, and we were preaching one night, and we were right by this. Um, we were right by this this this. I don't know what what the god was that they were they worship, but it was like this big thing of uh, all these fruits that they were offering to this thing. Um, so yeah, I've it was dark though. I've seen so many idols in the Far East. Right. I have a very difficult time comprehending how someone can worship something that is made out of metal. What what I've seen basically has been metal. What? Half the cars I see that and they got something, the intelligence <laughs> they got something of, on the mirror that they're worshiping. The, the, the intelligence yeah. of, yeah. I guess it's mixed up in the culture, you know? It's, and, and, it's, it is culture. And how they're born. And culture, tradition, you know. And listen, it, yeah, I was it, guilty of that too. A, right. So, yeah. Very, very confusing because I have seen these. <laughs> I went, I went through, I, I think I told but you, John, even, all even, of my it, photographs. Even a lot more subtle than that is not a physical thing. Which is what they did, right? Uh, but an idol of the heart, an idol of oh, okay. which, an idol, which, yes, which is an idol really, of the heart is something which that, is which is really what we're warned against, right? Very few of us are going to be bound down to a piece of wood or a stone, uh, but we'll be bound down to you know lusts and greed and everything else. Yes, Candy. It was just a question of what you know. Are we were created as human beings, an image of God, but someone once told me that we we created to worship something. Because we have this uh, 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 empty hole in us that we have to yeah. worship something that well, they don't know about Christ. Absolutely. And God doesn't change their heart. They're going to worship something. They can worship that AC. Candy, for as long as there have been men, men have been worshiping something. Because yeah. we, we are worshipers by nature. Yeah. And so not until, until Christ saves somebody and the Spirit of God indwells them yeah. is there a perfect fit now for the, for the gap that we have to worship. You know, everything else that we put in there just does, it doesn't satisfy. It may feel good for a season. But yeah, Absolutely. good point. All right. So the Jews do not acknowledge nor obey their heavenly king. They're, 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 they're immersing themselves in the, in, the, in the ways of the people. And this is the consistent pattern of the book of Judges. Judges is like not a positive book in this sense. All right. <laughs> it's not a positive book in this sense uh, because it shows you this slide down. Right. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's gearing up, and it's moving toward, eventually, David, when the kings come. And David, of course, is bringing us into the, in, you know, it's, it's pointing us to the messianic kingdom. All right? Uh, now, there's a cycle that goes on in the book of Judges. It's a cycle that goes on throughout most of the book. Does anybody know what the cycle is? Well, I don't know about it. I think it gets, they, they fall into calamity, they leave God, they cry out, and he comes and saves them, and then they go back. And then All right, saves. excellent. All right, I wrote it this way, but you're right. It's, it's kind of a four-parter. They disobey God. God sends some sort of oppression on them from somebody, right? Some, some heathen king or ruler comes in and overtakes them. They then cry out to God because they're oppressed. And then God gives them a deliverer or a judge. And then after a while, they, they, they disobey again and they sin again. And so the, it just keeps going in circles, you know? Circle, 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 circle. And... And the fact that God keeps delivering them and keeps giving them, keeps giving them uh, <laughs> judges and keeps hearing them, it shows us his covenant faithfulness, right? And it shows us his patience and his long suffering. Because quite honestly, you know, after the second, third, fourth, and fourteenth time, most of us would be, I'm done. I'm done with these, these, you know, these, these you know, disloyal, dishonest, unloving, hard-hearted rejectors of people. But he doesn't. All right, now note that when the foreign oppression came, it didn't come to all of Israel. So when we look at a judge and we look at a problem, it doesn't mean all of Israel has that problem. Right? It doesn't mean all of Israel is, is under whatever, you know, that, 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 you know, that oppressor is. Right? Uh, but an area or a tribe of it. Right? So when, when, and it doesn't mean that the judge is judging all of Israel. It just means he's judging that little area, whatever it is. Right? Whatever area, whatever tribe he's, he's in. Right. Uh, so a deliverer or a judge judged an area of Israel. Now, the dating of the book, most scholars believe the judges happened somewhere between 1380 B.C. and 10, uh, 1050 B.C., which would have been the, the rise of King Saul. And so they would say that the period would be about 350 years. Uh, the flow of the book, there's a prologue, which we'll look at today to some degree. 
uh, there's a main body which gives us the account of this cycle going on and on and on and on and on and the different judges that God would raise up to, to help the people, giving accounts of those things. Uh, there are major judges and minor judges. Can anybody, I, I gave them to you, you can look if you want, but if you don't want to look, tell me what are some of the major judges and who are some of the minor ones, if you know. Well, you could look. So you mentioned Ehud and Gideon. That's right. my favorite. Samson. Samson, right, right. Everyone knows Samson. Yeah. Samson, Samson right. right, right. All right, there's some pretty interesting people there. Like, you know, Gideon's an interesting guy. Yeah. Jephthah's the most interesting of all, I think. Samson, one would think he wasn't even a saved man until you get to the book of Hebrews, all right, uh, from, from what we read about him. Deborah, she's the only woman in the bunch. Uh, Ehud, uh, uh, Othniel, Arth all right, and so, so the minor guys, you don't know much about them. Shamgar, Tola, Jair, uh, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdan. All right, and so we'll, we're going to look at all of them. Some of them, there's nothing to say other than like they, they, they judge for like X amount of time, and we don't know anything about them. All right, uh, and then there's an ending or an epilogue. The last four chapters would be that, uh, and that really shows us the unbelievable religious and moral corruption and this downslide and decay. Uh, it just gets, it goes from bad to worse. All right, so by the time you get to 1 Samuel, it's a mess, and then... When, when Samuel comes, we see us, we, we, we start to go back up. All right, that being said, as we'll look into chapter 1, uh, what God has faithfully given it, uh, Israel, the land of Canaan, he's promised them this, goes all the way back to, uh, uh, to Abraham. Uh, he's given them amazing victories under Moses, and he's given them amazing victories under Joshua. Now they possess the land, and, and, and they have to drive out the remaining Canaanites. And when we say Canaanites, that goes for really all of the people in the land of Canaan. There were seven ites, Girgashites, Hittites, I can't even name them all. But there's seven ites that are in the land. They've got to drive them out. They've got to drive them out. Uh, now, why must they, from your own thinking, why must they drive out these pagan peoples? Well, they, they, they can influence them with their worship and lead them away from the true God. Amen. Amen. All right. Anything else? Yeah, and also because uh, <clears throat> I think primarily because God had decreed, you know, He had commanded them to. And uh, I, as a side note, yeah. I don't want to say yeah, too no, much, but um, a lot of people, when they read the Old Testament, they have a real problem uh, with God uh, <laughs> pouring out justice yeah. on the Canaanites and making war. And uh, what a lot of I think that what a lot of what a lot of people don't understand, and what we didn't understand before we became Christians, is that what we're seeing displayed is God's holiness and His righteousness. You know that He has all the right to take these people out of the land. First of all, because it's His land, and because they've broken His laws, and and He'll do it to His own people when they disobey Him. He'll use. The Assyrians and the Babylonians as, the, as, a, as a rod of justice against them because he is a holy God. And you know, the, uh, the idea that, that, well, you know what, the God of the Old Testament is a mean bully and Jesus is kind is absolutely is the most ridiculous, ridiculous thing one can say because, because Jesus is God, the Father is God, they don't change. Amen. Yes, Bob? We really see that with Saul, you see. He was supposed to go in on the Amorites, slay them all, he kept, God really came down with him yeah. when the prophet came to him. We also see that to Joshua and Ai that he went in there. Yeah. And uh, it's hard to really see it, but this is what God wants. And Deuteronomy 29, you know, his ways are not our you know, yeah, and, secret and, things and, of God. Yeah, and so, and that's a good point, guys. Thank you. And, and so, so what you're seeing is you're seeing the character of God. Yes, uh, one other point before we go too far is what always struck me when I read this is it's not that they weren't keeping the laws or to the best of their ability, they were still doing it. They were hedging their bets. They were doing both. And so one of the things is to drive them away so they wouldn't be influenced by the people there. Yeah, and so and so and we and we see this clearly in the New Testament, and we see it when God saves souls, is is he changes us. And even the word saint comes from the word sanctified, which means separated, all right? And so the people of God are no longer, the, the, when, so when God saves someone, you're no longer like the old you. He, say, he says, what, what, what communion, what fellowship does Christ have with Balaam? 
All right? What communion does believer have with unbeliever? So it doesn't mean that we don't love the unsaved. Of course we do. It doesn't mean that we reach out to the world. Of course we do. We should be salt and light to it. But we're not like it anymore. So what was tasteful and enjoyable and delightful and what we engaged in, which was sinful, it should not be a desire anymore. And so he wants us to be separated. Be holy for I am holy. All right? And so there's a new calling, or there's a calling that we didn't have before that we, do, we now have in Christ. And so we're to live for him. Even as he lived holy, although he, he walked am, among you know, the world and, and, you know, and many unsaved, uh, but, but he lived holy. But he loved men, and he, he served men, and he saved some men. All right? And so, so it's never changed. The idea of holiness has never changed. The mandate for holiness has never changed. Now we're seeing in Israel... That, 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 that they can't keep it. Hey, Benny. All right, we're seeing it with Israel, they can't keep it, and that should drive them to, with the sacrificial system, with the promises, all right, with the prophecies, it should drive them to know that there's something much greater, all right, much greater coming. Uh, and, 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 and even the sacrifices and the feasts and everything should, you know, are, are pointing them, they're a shadow pointing to something, and the substance will be Christ. And some of them got it, and some of them didn't. So, so thank you to all you guys who kicked in there. All right. Um, uh, and so, so they drive out the remaining Canaanites, and, and they must do that because it will cause them to, as Jasmine said, they will end up engaging, worshiping the idols, uh, the idols of the land, and not God. And they will compromise, and eventually they will forget God. And eventually... Uh, they, will, they, will be, they will be put into bondage by their enemies, eventually. They'll just keep sliding down. Uh, the same is true for, for us, uh, for, for, for us uh, once who've been saved, all right? We have to mortify sin, or it's going to cripple us. You can't play with it. Uh, uh, we, we, we have to mortify sin. There must be a driving out of our lives those things uh, which, 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 would, which would cause us, you know, to fall. Like we need to drive out the Canaanites of our lives. We'll get into that a little more as we go on. All right. Somebody read Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. This is instructions when they, when they get into the, to the promised land. When you when come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of, these na of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. Or, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations of the Lord, your God drives them out from before you. You should be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispossess, listen to the soothsayers and diviners, but as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. All right. When you get there, beware, watch out, don't engage in, don't engage in all of this, you know, um, um, you know, supernatural, black magic, tarot cards, you know, whatever, 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 whatever. Don't engage in this stuff. God says he hates it. Because what it is, is it's trying to tell the future and not trusting in God alone. All right. And so he gives you all of these individuals and these groupings of peoples, you know, and he says that those who make their sons or daughters pass through the fire, they sacrifice their children. Yeah, yeah there was the idea that the, with the crops, that if you sacrifice the child, then the crops will come. They didn't trust God. Right. They, they would do things like that. Right. right. And of course, we could, we could parlay that into abortion in our day. All right. Uh, but as we said, so there was this constant cycle of sin that was constantly repeating itself throughout, throughout their time and through the book of Judges. So the question is, how did they go from these amazing victories in Joshua? And they did. If you read the book of Joshua, and it, takes, and, and it doesn't happen like in a, it seems like it all happens like in a very short period of time. It takes a lot of years. Right? But how did they go through these amazing victories in Joshua to the despair and, and the defeat in the book of Judges? Like how do you go from this height to all the way to this, 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 this basement. Well, chapter 1 sets the stage for how you do that. And it gives us the heart of the problem. Somebody read Judges 1.1. 1, 1. <clears throat> now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, 
Who shall be the first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. All right, so we're going to see in chapter 1. Not yet, though. We're going to see it in chapter 1. We're going to see like the, the beginning of the crack or the chink in the armor. Not yet, but we're going to see it. All right, so so here we have, um, we have, um, let's see, let's see. The children of who should go up. And God says, well, let it, let it be Judah go up. I have delivered the land into his hand. All right, for decades, the children of Israel are led by either Moses or Joshua for many decades. Uh, and now they have no human leader that way. Yet, the kingdom of God continues. It forges forward even though the servants of God are not there anymore. In this case, these uh, uh, Joshua and, and Moses. But in our case as well. And the people of God need to find their help and need to find their hope in the Lord. Right? Uh, and not in their pastors or their favorite preachers or in Christian authors uh, or in other leaders. All right? As... as as much as a blessing those individuals are to the church, hopefully, ultimately, you know, it's not their church, it's not my church, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, they are only a tool used for a season, you know, by the Lord as he is, as he is you know, as he is, you know, furthering his kingdom and, 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 you know, and raising up his church. That's it, all right? And so we can't anchor and put all of our trust or, or you know, anchor in the men themselves or the men themselves. Even, even though Moses was a great blessing and was a great leader, and Joshua was as well. And so now, Israel says, who should go? What do we do? You know, and God says, well, send Judah first. All right, send Judah first. Uh, and, so, and so they need to purge the land of the Canaanites, and God says, he answers their question, Judah goes first. All right, and, and how does God comfort Judah? Somebody read verse 2 and tell me how God comforts Judah. I, I didn't give you verse 2. Oh, you did. oh, I did? It's a part of the... Uh, all right, tell me... That's right. Somebody read verse 2 again. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. All right. Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. Now, how, how does God comfort Judah in that, in that verse? That's Natalie. That's Will. That's Jazzy. Jazzy. Yeah, he, he comforts them because he already said that he handed them over. Amen. So they, they don't, he already took care of it. They don't have anything to worry about. Yeah. Indeed, I have, I have delivered them into, into his hand. I've done it. It's a done deal. Just act it out now. Just go through the motions. Just be faithful to do your part now because I, I'm telling you, I'm, this is what I'm doing. God is saying, I'm going to do it. Right? And that's a great comfort. Right? Right? God is giving the victory. He says he's going to give the victory. Right? And, and so he will do it. Uh, and, but you have to go and fight. Right? You have to go and fight. And, and the same thing is going to be true throughout all the book, uh, 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 throughout all the book of, 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 of Judges, but it was all through the book of Joshua. He's already told them, in, 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 you know, Moses told them before they were going to the promised land, he's giving it to you. You're going to win. The battle is the Lord's. Don't worry. He's given you this land. He's promised you this land. It goes all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's promised it. He's given it to you. But now I want you to go and fight. I want you to rally the troops and go. You know what amazes me, Pastor? He is Judah, right? The first child, Jacob, right? He has Joseph thrown into the pit, okay? <laughs> and that basically God's going to use him. And that basically he's going to be the surety what takes place maybe in Genesis 45, when they go back yeah. to Joseph, Benjamin, and that type of a thing. And then we see in Genesis 48, where Jacob is giving Judah all of the space, all of the accolades. The septum. Yeah. The septum of the Yeah. Probably, yeah. as everyone knows, that Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. Right. Man, yeah. yeah. Well, you see it there, Bob. You see it there. You see the, you see the messianic thread going yeah, through. that's a good point. Yeah, I was going to point that... Uh, that was a good, uh, good job he did because uh, God is already giving Judah preeminence. And, you know, and when, when, you, when you look at uh, the story of the scriptures, you know, we know that um, the Messiah is coming from Judah. Yeah. And so we already see it like playing out in yeah. the first chapter. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah, All right. So, so, so they got to go. He's already promised victory. God cannot lie. 
And he's already, he has done miracle after miracle. They've seen the ten plagues. They've gone through the Red Sea. They've been, they've been kept all the 40 years in the wilderness. They've seen all the battles happen. And, 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 and you know, they've seen all the victories except for Ai. And then they finally wipe them out anyway uh, in the book of Joshua. And now he tells them to go again. All right, and they've seen it. And so the question is, how is this also true in the Christian life? The victory is absolutely assured. God has promised, and and yet, you know, we have to do stuff, don't we? Like we're we're, you know, I mean, can we just say, I need a job, and just sit back and, you know, wait till God throws one on our lap? I guess we could do that, but I don't think we're going to get one. See, the key word there is the word ability. Like when you were saying before on that holiness, I was saying if ye through the foot do mortify the deeds of the body. Right. You shall be saved that if, you see. Yeah. Now, we have the ability. Why? Because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit in us. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. I want to say, there's an expression that you would hear you say, let go and let God. Yeah. Uh -huh. like, you know, and you would hear that, like, you know, as if that's just like sanctification. Well, listen, he who doesn't work is, yeah. is like worse than an infidel. You know, who doesn't take care of his family. I mean, so, so you know, well, I just pray, Lord, that you provide my family. Well, guess what? I got to get a job. You know, <laughs> I thought I'm worth it enough for them. All right? Listen, we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We have to work That's out great. what God has put already in us. Right? We just don't sit back. He's put his spirit in us. He's changed our hearts. He's given us life. He, he's, he's, he's given us a hope. Right? We have all the promises and all the blessings and, and spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, but now we have to work it out. Right? So we have to work it out. You see, we, the TV evangelists say that you just look at the cross, you see, and they don't understand that we are, these are indicatives, these are imperatives, these are commands. When you go to like Romans 6 and that Basically, I'm so thrilled that everyone here understands that. Let go and let God do it. That's bogus. I mean, this is something where we all have that ability, and it's great, you know. It's just that people, it's work. Because God is most glorified when, when we trust Him and we labor for Him. Good. He's most glorified we, when we bear fruit for Him. All right? And so, yes, brother. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, tagging with him, uh, you know, 1 Timothy 4.7, uh, oh, yeah. Paul commands Tim Timothy, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Yeah. And so yeah. uh, we're called to, to discipline ourselves, and that's work. Amen. And it, 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 it kind of ties into evangelism, because God has a specific people that he will save, guaranteed he's going to save that exact group of people, but he still wants us to go out and evangelize. Because right? here's why. Well, here's one reason why. There may be a lot. We are the means to his end. Right? God has an end in view. He always has an end in view. But his people and even circumstances are the means that he uses. All right? Sometimes he even uses sin, although he's not the author of it, as the means to his end, i.e. the cross. It is, it is absolutely, you know, it is, it is murder and betrayal and vile wickedness on the part of the, the Jewish leaders and the Jews, and, and it is, a, a, it is a, an abuse of justice on the, on, the, on the part of the Romans, all right? I mean, it is absolutely sin all the way around. And yet God uses it to put his son on the cross, to pour out holy wrath on, the cro on his son so that he could save sinners. I'm and sorry for coming in, Pastor. This will be very helpful. I had a problem 22 years ago with a certain group, you know, and the word is God's... Uh, sovereignty and man's responsibility. They couldn't understand that right. because they didn't see the word ability and they basically were hyper-Calvinist, you see, and that's very important to understand that. All right, so Bob, you have to explain that word so everybody understands what, what it is. Give a All quick right. definition. Of God is sovereign and no, no. what you're saying no, that... No, explain, explain the word hyper-Calvinism. Just oh, give it a quick definition. Hyper-Calvinism is... Uh, basically where uh, election, uh, you're elected, you really don't have to pray, you really don't have to go out and evangelize because uh, we're elected and this is what takes place on that. So yeah, God's going to do what God's going to do, he doesn't need God's us, so, do so you know, we don't have to do anything, let God do it, he's going to do it anyway. 
right? That's basically the position of, of the hyper-Calvinist, right? But of course, that's unbiblical. All right. Well, so, so listen, as far as the Christian life goes, we have to work out what he's already given us, right? He gave it to us, but he wants us to live for him. He wants us to use our lives for him. He wants us to be living sacrifices, Paul says in Romans 12, right? He wants us to glorify him by being Christ-like. And how was Christ? A selfless servant. He gave himself as a ransom for many. All right? And so he wants us to have that mind, you know, and to be driven that way. All right? That brings him glory. And as Tim, Tim Liverpool says, not once, not twice, but maybe 400 times, the ultimate end of, 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 of all things is God's glory, which is true. It's just God's glory. Yeah. I hope Tim is watching. Amen. All right. All right. So, so you know, indeed we are, as, as Dan was quite saying, we are, God's, we are God's means to his end. That's why we pray. Part of praying is with the means to his ends. Part of praying is so it, it, not that he would line up with us, but that we would line up with him. That we would be good with whatever he's doing. Not your will, not my will, but your will be done. All right? And so, so listen, it's all about us magnifying him and glorifying him and living for him in, in, in a world that is dark. Because quite honestly, he's going to save some people in that dark world by using some of us who he's already saved to go out into that dark world and shine the light of Christ. Or as he says with the sheep and wolves analogy, he says, I'm sending you out as sheep to the wolves, meaning I'm sending you guys out there because some of those wolves are going to become sheep when you go out and, and share with them. And then I'm going to send them out to the wolves. All right, and so... And his promise to his pastor would be that then he's going to fall to the left and the right of you, but he's always going to protect you. Yeah, well, and, it's, and, and the thing is, nothing can happen to you apart from his will. It doesn't mean you won't be martyred. Doesn't mean you won't suffer. Doesn't mean you won't struggle. Yeah, I mean, but nothing will happen to you apart from His will. Amen. And ultimately, the victory has already been won for you. Christ has won it for you already on the cross. It's been done. Amen. All right. So no matter what happens in this life, that's why Jesus said to His disciples in John 10, I mean, I'm sorry, Matthew 10, He said, "Don't fear Him who can kill the body, but can't do anything to the soul. But rather fear Him who could cast both body and soul into hell." Don't fear man. The worst man can do is kill you. But then you, your, your soul goes to heaven and when it comes back, you'll get a resurrected body to go with that a resurrected soul. All right. So, so, so it's like the Christian life as well. It's for us as well. It's already done for us, but now we have to, we have to, to live for him. All right. Well, in verse 3, Judah does something pretty interesting. They go ahead and they recruit Simeon. And then we read, So Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me to my allotted territory, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. All right, so Judah's, Judah's a big tribe. It's an important tribe. All right, so actually, it's one of the most important tribes. And, and, and they go to Simeon, and Simeon is like one of the least important tribes. It's one of the smallest tribes. Right? And so what we see is, we, we see, we see the, the, the big guy going to the little guy saying, will you help me? Will you work with us? And the little guy saying, we'll work with you. Right? And so we see that God's people work in, in corporate unity. Right? Uh, we see this with the sons of Joseph, with Manasseh and Ephraim later on. They will work together in verse 22 to go up against Bethel. Right? And so will you come with me, help me, and then when you go for yours, we'll help you. Right? And so the question, I guess, is how can the people of God and churches work together for a common goal? Now, let me preface that by saying, you've got to be on the same page, of course. You know what I mean? <laughs> Not gonna be, you know, we're not going to be you know, running around with the, with the Benny Hins of the world slapping people down. You know? I mean, with you know, gospel-minded, you know, you know, faith-driven, you know, glory of God-focused you know, individuals. We, you know, big churches, small churches, we should work together. Right? How could we work together? Missions, evangelism, how else? Uh, you know, just laboring the gospel. You know, like that's, what's, that's, that's our unity. You know, that's yeah. our fellowship. So yeah. whatever is going to promote the gospel, you know, that's how we can work together. It's a big kingdom and, and, and a lot of people in it and a lot of places, you know, laboring. And so it's, it's not about us. It's not about Grace Baptist Church and in this little neck of the woods. I mean, you know, the church. And so if we can be a blessing and aid, you know, a, 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 a sister church somewhere else, we, we should be. And at times we have been, you know. Helping, helping, you know, Tanya's mother's church and their group, you know, evangelizing in Corona. I mean, it's just one of many ideas and things. But we should do that, and we, and we do do that, all right? Uh, the unity 
The unity and fellowship of God's people is a vehicle of experiencing his strength and his blessing. And so we should do that. All right, in verses 4 to 7, we have this interesting battle now with this man, uh, with the people at Bezek. Would somebody read verses 4 to 7? Then Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they killed 10,000 men at Bezek, and they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and fought against him. And they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Then Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued him and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to gather scraps under my table, as I have done. So God has repaid me. Then they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. All right, interesting story, I would say. A lot of interesting stories in the book of Judges. All right, so Judah kills 10,000 men at Bezek, and then they hunt down uh, Adani Bezek, who is their leader, or their king, uh, who is the lord of that area, and they cut off his big thumbs and his big toes. Why do they do that? Why do they cut? Well, first of all, I mean, you know, well, I'll let you answer first. <laughs> Why do they cut off his big thumbs and his big toes? I'll take a shot. They're like... Warriors, so that would make maybe that would make them not to um, to like I guess fight anymore. Uh, maybe to humiliate them. Okay, um, that's good. Yeah, yeah it's good. It's a, it's a shaming thing. You're not your warrior is not going to be doing much fighting with no thumbs. Yes. Not going to be walking much with no big toes, right? Uh, uh, what else? Anything else? No, it's because he did the same thing. Yeah, awesome. yeah. to seven the other kings. He made them try to pick up scraps without yeah. a thumb. Yeah. Table. yeah, there's a reason why God gave us thumbs, right? The other four fingers don't work good without them. Uh, and so, so yeah, uh, and, and you know, it was an eye for an eye kind of thing. You did this to the 70 kings, well, that's going to happen to you. You humiliated them and shamed them and publicly, you know, you know destroyed them amongst the people. Well, here you go. Now, uh, why is bringing him to Jerusalem a problem? Notice it says... Then they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Why is that a problem? What's the problem with them bringing him to Jerusalem? Because God didn't say to do that. All right. Yes. And they also had, um, yes. They also had respect the persons. They killed everyone else. Why would they keep him? Because it's his royalty? Or? All right. It, it goes back to what, what, that's true, but it goes back to really what Mabel is saying, and something that Bob said before. God commanded them. God commanded them to destroy everybody, you know, when they went in somewhere. Not to leave anybody alive. Somebody read Deuteronomy 20.17 and then 7.1 and 2. Completely destroy them, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Pezzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Completely. Wipe it out. Cleanse the place. All right? It's like getting sin out of the closet. Get it out of there. All right, Deuteronomy 7.1 and 2. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Gershites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jubisites. Those are your seven ites, by the way. Seven. You got the mosquito seven. bites, too. <laughs> <laughs> seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, no sh with them, nor show mercy to them. Conquer, destroy, utterly destroy them. Yet we see a partial obedience from the Jews. Right? They did most of what they were supposed to do, most of it, but they neglected some of it or one area of it. And this is a little kink in the armor. Now you see this little crack? It's like it's like our stoop out there, right? If we don't put that stuff over it in the summertime, that, that, um, that sealing stuff, right? We get a little crack and the rain goes in when it gets cold, it turns to ice, it gets bigger. Next thing you know, Moses is complaining, the trustees are getting on our case, and now we gotta get the guy here again to fix the steps because the cracks get big, all right? And so a little crack, a little crack, a little bigger, a little bigger, before you know it, it's a, ma it's a massive wedge. And it's starting right here. Right? They take him back to Jerusalem. Take him back to Jerusalem. This is the beginning 
This is the beginning of greater disobedience. It's a little, but it's the beginning. God says, wipe them out. They don't wipe them out. Instead, they want to showcase them. They want to humiliate them. They want to, you know, trophy, show the trophy of their, of their victory by cutting off the big toes and the big thumbs of this guy, or the thumbs, and let them live in Jerusalem. Why? Maybe it's to gloat. Everybody will see every time they see this guy with no thumbs and no toes, like, you know, stumbling around, they would say, oh, the mighty Judah, you know, the mighty uh, uh, Simeon, go ahead and, you know, taking down, you know, Bezek and his people. All right? Uh, that's what's going on here. Now, Bob, what was the example you gave before from, from 1 Samuel 15? Same with, thing going with on. With Saul. All right. Uh, what took place there, and uh, he didn't do it. All right. He kept some of the animals, and uh, I believe Samuel came to him. Yeah. And basically, uh, that was the end of him. Wow. 1 right. Samuel, I gave it to you. 15.3. Somebody read it. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both men and women, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. All right, that's the command. Tells, he, God tells, tells, tells King Saul through Samuel, the prophet, go do this. Saul doesn't do it. He does most of it. He does actually 98% of it. But he doesn't, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't kill King Ahab. He spares him. And he spares the best of the sheep. Uh, and, and when Samuel comes and he's the bleeding of the sheep, he said, what is this I hear? And Saul, basically, he lies and then he blames it on the people. Right? Well, we went over to the Lord. And then he said, but they made me do it. All right? Ultimately, because of this, he loses his kingdom. He loses. God says, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to raise up a man better than you. Now, it's going to take another 30-something years for that to happen. All right? It's going to take another 30 because Saul reigns for 40 years before David becomes king. I don't even think David's born yet, actually. All right, so it's going to take another another thirty something years, but God says this kingdom will not will not. In other words, your sons will not be you know will, will not you know they will not be passed down. They will not be passed down. Therefore, point is, small acts of disobedience usually grow into bigger acts of disobedience. If you put your toes in the water, no pun intended for Agag there or for or for Bezek, it it won't. <laughs> take long before you're up to your knees and eventually you're swimming in it. It just doesn't take long. All right? And this is what we see in the book of Judges. All right? And so, therefore, you know, for us, can't give an inch. Can't give an inch into sin. We just can't. If we let our guard down and whatever it is that, that tempts us, it'll suck us in and it'll spiritually kill us. It'll spiritually kill us. Now, what kind of examples might we have in our day in this way? Well, I have a good example that uh, what happens to people that they put on the whole armor of God and they're not going to verse 10, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, you see. They go to step two. And what they'll do also in the Ten Commandments, they don't, if you don't have one, that's it. It's like if you don't have the atonement. But basically, you have to be strong in the Lord and the power of the might. Then you put on the armor of God. All right, give me practical examples now in our day. I'll give you one, and I'll start you off. All right, um, we're told believers are told not to date unbelievers. Mm -hmm. All right, they're told not to be unequally yoked. All right, and so, so, so if if you, I mean, and the reason why that you know that 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 you have to be so super careful about you know not giving an inch because it doesn't take much to go an inch and to go a foot and to go a yard and to be you know saying I do. And marrying somebody that you're not, you know, you're not, you're not yoked up with, you know, that you're spiritually not on the same level with, it doesn't take much, you know. All right, how else? Uh, don't neglect the fellowship. All right, of that's a good one, Bob. Thank you. Hebrews right? ten. Hebrews ten twenty five. So if you're watching this now on on Facebook, and you come to this church, and you decide, well, you know what, I don't really come anymore on Sunday morning. Well, you're doing that too. I have to go there either. All right? But we're commanded in Hebrews 10.25 to not neglect the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. All right? And so, so we're commanded to corporately come together to worship. And so, so it would be easy to, well, this and that, and I don't know this, and I can listen to it online, and I can watch it on Facebook, now, damn puts it on. All right? Um, or whatever. That's a good one. How else? Yes. Well, sorry. 
Like you're a big at, guy, but the handle's really bad. <laughs> like uh, at work, you know, we, we have certain rule books to go by, and one of the things that they have is if you see anything that's off out of the field, you report it. But the old school guys, they don't want to report anything because that's more work for us. So I got into like a little back and forth uh, last week. It was something very small, and for a second I thought, you know what, why, you know, why argue with this guy? Let me just, you know, stay quiet and, and just keep going. And immediately I was thinking, why check the train at all? Why not just, <laughs> I, I kid you not, I said, why go around it? It's true, just make sure there's no damage and get on immediately. But then I thought, I'm going to spare his feelings and offend God. But, you know, it's just, you know, it just goes according to the scriptures that, you know, if, if you let a little go, it's going to snowball immediately. You know what, it starts with a little and then it gets easier and easier yeah. to go deeper and deeper. Uh, and so, yeah, you got to be on guard. Whether it be dating, uh, uh, you know, friendships, uh, close, intimate friendships, uh, the Lord's Day, um, you know, the, the, your job. You know what I mean? Like you're cheating on, you know, well, you leave 10 minutes early and then you leave 20 minutes early. Before you know it, you, you know, you're leaving six hours early and someone else is clocking you in. True. You know? Uh, and so it just becomes easier and easier. The hardest one of them all is for myself is uh, everyone has this hope, purifies himself as he is uh, pure, and then seeing you have purified your souls into obeying the truth, unto unfanged, uh, fervent love for the brethren, and that, you know, also in Corinthians 7, it's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, and that basically you were saying in the beginning with that holiness, that's one of the hardest things for me, that I have to be a holy man, and basically everyone knows the verse, be ye holy as I am holy, but the one before that is be ye holy in all manner of conversation. So that's yeah. a hard one for me, Pastor. Yeah. Amen. Not that it's good, but you're actually right. All right. Uh, oh, one more time. It's gossip. God, oh, mm. there's one for you. Gossip, yeah. Start yeah, today you just a little, do the list, little birdie in the ear there, a little birdie in the ear there. Before you know it, man, you're like singing all over the place, you know, and it's just easy to do it. So you're right. All right, in verses eight and ten, eight to ten, we see the conquest of Jerusalem and Hebron and Debir. In verses twelve to fifteen, they deal with the conquest of Debir again, which is was formerly called uh, Kirjath Sefer. And there, somebody read that. Twelve to fifteen. Then Caleb said, Whoever attacks Kerjath Sefer and takes it, to him I will give my daughter Ashash as wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. So he gave him his daughter Ashash as wife. Now it happened when she came to him that he, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you wish? So she said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have given me land in the south. Give me also springs of water. All right, thank you. All right, Caleb, as Bob said before, very godly man. He was greatly used by God. He was sort of partners with Joshua in many ways. Uh, 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 he is allotted territory around uh, uh, the Hebron area by Joshua. Uh, and so he puts forth a challenge. Whoever captures the neighboring Debur gets his daughter. Uh, and his nephew, actually, Othniel is his nephew. His nephew goes out and takes it, uh, and, and she's given to him as his wife. Uh, and so what does she want from her father? She wants springs of water uh, uh, near the land that, 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 that he's given her. Why? Because it's a, it's a, it's a desert land. Uh, and so she's requesting, obviously, water for it. Uh, and, you know, listen, without water, guess what you got? You got nothing. You're not going to produce anything on that land. Uh, wouldn't really be of any good. Uh, and, and Caleb says, okay. And he lavishes her with water. And I'm sure there's a spiritual... Holy Spirit, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, Takes you out. Right? It's the same. Uh, and so, so she's very blessed. All right, verse 16. We see yet another compromise. I'm sorry, Lord. I was just going to say, just to continue what you said before. Between you guys are pretty, your hands are very low. Uh, what you were saying before is, but I always think how beautiful that is, that God promised him the land. But he had to get someone to go take it. Yeah. And then he, he it's, it's like, but he, in his mind, it's my land. It's his land. This is, a, this is a lot of faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So again, you see the the the, the sovereignty of God, the responsibility of man. All right. But Verse that six, same story comes up in Joshua fourteen. The yeah. same setting. Yeah. That takes place there. Fourteen six to fifteen. Yeah, and it shows that uh, Caleb is eighty five years old. Yeah. At that particular time. Yeah, but he's still pretty strong, even though he's he's elderly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and in verse 16, we see yet another compromise. We see the seeds of apostasy being sown. There we read, Now the children of the, of the, of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms uh, with, his ch with the children of Judah uh, into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the south near Arad, and went down and dwelt among the people. All right? And the seed here is that they dwelt among the people. They dwelt among the people. Instead of driving them out, which is what they were supposed to do, they dwelt among them. All right? And in verses 17 to 20, uh, they take more land. But in verse 19, it says, says the Lord was with Judah, but, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland. Here's why. Because they had chariots of iron. Then in verse 21, we read that the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem, so the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. All right? And, and this, this is the first failure of three from verses 21 to 36. All right? and, and seven times the writer is going to pound this message home that they did not drive out the Canaanites. They went in, they took some of it, they took most of it, but they didn't get everybody out of it. Seven times. And I'll just tell you them and we'll read them. Verse 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. They did not do it all in, in each case. Did I give you all those? Yes. 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 Somebody just read them through. Verse 27. Arab of Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean in its villages or Tanakh in its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor in its villages, or the inhabitants of Ibrahim in its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo in its villages. For the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. And it came to pass, when Israel was strong, that they put the Canaanites under the tribute, but did not completely drive them out. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites, who dwelt in Gezer, so the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Nor did Zebulon drive out the inhabitants of Ketron, or the inhabitants of Nehalah. So the Canaanites dwelt among them and were put under the tribute. Nor did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Achor, or the inhabitants of Sidon, or of Elab, Ixid, Helpa, Aphek, or Rahab. So the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out, nor did Nephtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, or the inhabitants of Beth Tanah, but they dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. All right, mm -hmm. so lots of the tribes, they do not drive out. Yes, Carmen? No, no. Oh, sorry. All right, so, so the inhabitants, so the, 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 uh, uh, the different tribes, they do not drive out uh, the peoples of the land all the way. All right, they do not drive out the people of them. And some of them, you'll see in, 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 in you know, with Manasseh, uh, the, the Canaanites were determined to dwell in the land. All right, uh, and so when it says they, they put them under tribute, that means they charged them, they, they, made, they made them pay taxes. They, they, they made them pay and do like slave labor. You know, so they, they, were, they were, you know, making money over them. Now, what are the things that we must drive out of our lives? See, listen, listen we are them. We're like them. There are things we have to drive out. As Christians, there are things we have to drive out of our lives and out of our hearts. There are things that are still in there that still murk around those, you know, the shadows of our hearts that we got to drive out. And what happens if we don't? All right, so what are the things we got to drive out? Idols. Idols. And what's an idol? Like, tell me, name me what an idol could be. Give me idols. It could be a car, it could be a person, it could be, yeah. Listen, Zion could be an idol. Yep. Not that you don't love him to death, but, but, but he could be an idol. Our children could be an idol. Our jobs could be an idol. Myself. Intellectual pride is probably the worst. Right. All right. It's myself. Right. All right. I'm the problem. You could be an idol. All right. Yeah. All right. Listen, you can make your church an idol. All right. You can, you, I mean, you know, you, you, I mean, you can make your friends an, an idol. Or music, or money, or sex, or anything. All right? I mean, the list is extremely long. Anything that is enthroned in your heart, that's your idol. All right? That's it. That's, that's an idol, whatever it is. And there are idols that are in there, and sometimes no one knows it but you. All right? And so, when God saves us, we've got to drive them out. We don't get them... Listen. We never get them all out. All the way. 
Paul says, not that I have arrived. I mean, in other words, we're not going to be perfected in this life. We're just not. Right? We're, going to, we're going to grow in holiness, and we're going to grow in godliness, and we're going to desire more and more to live for him, and we're going to cry out over sin more and more. That's the mourning part of it, right? Uh, but we should, you know, and there, there's things that need to be driven out. And, and when we're first saved, some of the physical things, very obvious, right? Very obvious, the physical things that are going on in our lives, that, you know, we know that, you know, you know I, I, I can't be, you know, you know, being in, 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 you know, in an adulterous situations or physical immorality situations. I know that, right? But there are other things later on that all of a sudden, pride, greed, covetous, you know, hatred, anger, uh, prejudice, whatever, those things can be creeping all over the place. How do you, what do you got to drive them out? Right? You got to drive them out. Desire for preeminence. Right? Uh, you know, um, selfishness. Drive, they got to be driven out. Harshness. You know, unwillingness to, to yield, not loving, unforgiving, right? Those have to be driven out. You gotta be, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta recognize it. Sometimes it's hard to see, but when we do, Lord help me drive it out. We gotta drive it out. Bitterness, jealousy, right? The list is long, and 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 it's hard because sometimes we can't see it. Sometimes we're blinded to it. Sometimes others maybe can see it better than we can see it in us. Right? Well, we see the stubbornness of the Canaanites in verse 27. The Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. All right? They were determined to dwell in that land. Uh, uh, and in verse 34, we read, And the Amorites were determined to dwell in Mount Heres, uh, uh, in Ajalon, and in Shalabin. All right? So here's the thing. Like let's 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 equate the, the 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 Canaanites being determined to stay in the land with with indwelling sin. Let's equate that because I think we can. All right, let's equate it to indwelling sin. It is hard because it's determined to to hang into the flesh. Right, uh, you know it does not easily go away. It is not easily put to death. Well, let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. Uh, let not sin have dominion over you, for you're not under grace, you're under grace, not under the law. Now, for example's sake, like, I go to the doctor, I have a cold, the doctor gives me that penicillin, there's still the remnants right. that had taken place. It's like the Allies, when they came in there, on D-Day, basically it was over, but there was still that fighting that was going over. But to me, when you look at that Romans 6, brother, and you see, do not yield your members to unrighteousness and those imperatives there that you got to do it, you got to try it. But this is why Paul said in Galatians 5, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Excellent. And so it's a battle that we're going to fight and we must fight. And it's a battle, listen, before you're saved, there's no battle going on. Right. Flesh wins everything. All right, flesh, flesh is king, spirit, you know, your spirit is dead. All right, but when God saves you, now you have, you're, you're spiritually alive. The Spirit of God is in you, and now you want to live for Him. But the old man is kicking around, and the flesh stirs up, and it gets inflamed, you know, and so there's the battle, all right? But listen, we do not have to, if we get knocked down, we, we should not stay down. We don't have to stay down, right? right? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all right? But, we, but if we think that the, that, 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 you know, if we think that you know sin is easily defeated, it's like the guy that's a that's an alcoholic, and God saves him. If he thinks he can go and hang out in a bar and just hang out and have a soda, wow. it's probably pretty foolish for that guy. All right, it's probably pretty foolish because he's going back into the lions then for him, so to speak. He'd be very unwise to do that, right? He'd be very unwise to do that. And and whatever our 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 our, our hot buttons are, so to speak, or the sins that so easily beset us. All right. And so, so I think that's a very interesting thing. They were determined to dwell there. They didn't want to get out. And that's like sin, isn't it? It doesn't, it, 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 it fights. It's in us. And, and we secretly love it. That's the thing is that we know it's wrong, but we love it. Right? Because we know, what it we know that it's got this it's fabulous taste, worldly speaking. And yet it's, it, it's detestable you know, to God. And, 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 it, and it is to us in our minds, but sometimes not in our hearts. We've got to kick it out. We've got to force it out. All right. Maybe we should blame Abraham. He was commanded in 12, Genesis 12, to go to Canaan. And he didn't want to do it, you know? 
he was the one that started all this by bringing his father-in-law and everything like that, but he didn't go to Canaan. Huh? There's always someone to blame. All right? The problem is that that doesn't work. It's got to be a poor guy. All right? Also, four times we read that the Jews or the Israelites put their enemies under tribute, which means forced labor. Uh, and, and, but this is no... So, so, here's, so here's their thinking, all right? Well, we're told to drive them out all the way, but look, if we don't drive them out, if we can't get rid of them, and we just put them under like forced labor and they work for us and we just collect money from them, it's a win-win. All right, that's their thinking. There's a profit here. So it's, so it's all right, we didn't, we didn't drive them out, but look at this. It's helping, you know, support the, support the community here. All right? That, that is the wrong way of thinking. Why is that? Why is that the wrong way of thinking? You're compromising. Come here for an excuse to keep it around. All right, and what happens if, if, if they stay that way? They'll grow stronger. That's it. And, and it does. That's what, that does. That's what happens here. All right? They compromise. They eventually are enticed by those whom they've enslaved, so to speak. All right? By their gods. They intermarry with them. Listen, this was Balaam's counsel to Balak. You guys know the story of Balaam and Balak? All right? Balak wants, wants, want, you know, Balak wants the prophet Balaam to come and to curse Israel as they're coming by his land. This is when uh, they, they haven't gone into the promised land yet. And he wants, he wants Balak, uh, Balaam to curse him. And so, so Balak says, I'll pay you whatever you want. Just curse these Israelites. And, 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 and basically, you know, God tells Balaam, you can't do it. We're not, you're not going to curse him. And so, so Balaam says, I, I can't curse him. Can't do it. But what he does do is he tells Balak, listen, you want to get those Jews? You want to slide them down? You want to have victory over them? Here's what you do. Befriend them. Mingle with them. Have your men and women marry their men and women. Not men with men, of course, and with women, but you know. Have, have them marry each other. And then they will come over to your gods. That's how you defeat them. That's how you break them. Right? That's how you take the stronghold away from them. And that's exactly what happened. All right? And so he goes, that's how you will sway them away from their God. Intermingle with them. Intermingle with them. All right? Moses commanded the Jews in Exodus 23, 33. All right? Um, um, they shall not dwell in your land, lest, lest they make you sin against me. Moses speaking for God. All right? For if you serve their gods, it'll surely be a snare to you. All right, so here's the thing. If you dwell with them in the land, what will happen over time is they will make you sin against me. They will weigh you down. This is the uh, Samson and Delilah deal. All right? Where's your power come from? Where's your strength come from? Where's your strength? You don't love me. You don't love me. First of all, the fact that he's with a woman who's not his wife is a problem to begin with. But she wore him down. She wore him down. Finally, like, oh, just, you know, just, you're a pain in my neck and you're, you're a continual drip. Okay, cut my hair. There's what my power is. And we'll see that when we go through this later on. All right? So in other words, what he's saying is, listen, listen. The Canaanites will be a spiritual cancer to you if you don't, if you don't oust them. It may not start right away, but it'll start to get in there and it's going to spread. And it's going to take time, but it's going to spread. All right? And once the Jews intermarried with them, became unequally yoked with them, it was downhill from there. Pretty soon, their kids and their grandkids started worshiping the balls and the Asherahs, and the Astras, right? And, and maybe even, as Glenn said, they were, you know, worshiping the Je Jehovah, the God of Israel, to some degree, and in some ways, you know, giving him some lip service or some, you know, you know, sacrificial service, so to speak. But they're divided. They have a divided heart. They're doing the stuff of, of the Lord God, but the heart is also doing stuff of the Baals and the Asherahs and everything else. They do that now when people intermingle yeah. their different religions and one of the... Jewish men married the Muslim, and they say they live together in perfect harmony. But something, something even about their religion, although they're heretics, you know, they 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 can't even get along. Even Christians marrying non-Christians, non-believers, right. that's just destruction. I remember, God said that He's a jealous God, and He will not share His glory with another. All right, and so He will not be. Oh, sorry. Was this high note or not? This you got to read a lot. Well, between you and Glenn, you guys are very low. But big guys, you're very low. Now, you reminded me of, uh, I think it's in Second Chronicles, of a, of a king that did everything that was right in the sight of the Lord, but his heart was, in, uh, was divided. You know which, which verse I'm talking about? 
Yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of them that did that. So, yeah, was it of Judah or Israel? He did not serve the Lord. He did not serve the Lord. Yeah, oh, but I don't, I don't remember was exactly it? where. I know the Second Chronicles. Okay, but it was, it was uh, just thinking about what you said. Like you can't was it the, was it Jehu? No, I don't remember the name. All right. I just remember the so, statement. <laughs> didn't Solomon become a divine when he took on all those eight hundred yeah. wives? Well, yeah, yeah, from yeah. Different yeah. Religions and started building the temples. And... But, but was he still like Solomon yeah. in that in that condition? Was he still doing what he was supposed to do in the sight of God? I mean, as far as actions is concerned, was he still? Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, Solomon, I mean, Solomon was loved by the Lord because he, it says so when yeah. when he was born, uh, and clearly God used him to to write a, a lot of scripture actually. Yeah. Uh, and he had a lot of flaws, you know, and listen, 700 wives and 300 concubines, and he, he accrued all of those women as alliances, political alliances with every nation around them, which is why he had peace with everybody. Um, but they swayed him. But it seems like when you read, when you read Ecclesiastes, that he, he comes back, he comes back to the Lord. You know what I mean? Like he realizes the massive error of his ways and the sin of his ways. But the ultimate point is the kingdom is taken away. Yeah, that's right. The so there's a punishment. Away. It made like for Christians. Clearly, that's why it was. That's why it's divided yeah. because of his sin. It's not necessarily salvation. Yes, good point. You get punished. All right, um, all right. And so in these verses, we see that Israel has success to some degree and to a great degree. It would be, uh, and 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 they do take control of the land mostly, but they're disobedient because they do not fulfill the word of the Lord. So it's like. You know, your parent asks, well, if you're a parent, you ask your children to do something, and you do it like 80%. You know, Michael, clean the room. He does everything but make the bed. You know what I mean? Or, you know, you know, make dinner. He does everything but, you know, like, you know, you know, put the meat on the plate. You know, whatever. But you do it, but you don't do it all the way. Uh, and the problem with that is it opens the door for, for getting looser and looser and looser and looser until you're not doing it at all. Right? And that's what happens here. All right, that's what happens here. And uh, just one more thing, because I, I love judges. Is the first thing they do is ask God, what should we do? And then the rest of the whole time of judges, they're doing whatever is good in their own sight. In their own eyes. That's it. Like, yeah. That's it. Yes, Dan. It, is it like this? It seems to me like it might be a little bit. It seems like they, God told them what to do, and they, they pretty much kind of did it. They did it to the extent that they could do it, but they didn't do it to the fullest extent. And then they started introducing their own stuff, thinking, oh, this will probably be as good in God's eyes or whatever. Like how a lot of other religions, like Catholicism, Mormonism, will add, they'll, they'll take the Bible, or their version of it or whatever, but they'll add their own stuff on top of it, thinking somewhere in their hearts that it'll please God. But it doesn't. Yeah. I would say a good example is... I would say another good example is like how we follow our taxes. You know, we told not to lie, we tell the truth, but then, you, you know, you fuzz a little bit here, you fudge a little bit there, and you, you start convincing yourself of the benefits, but you're lying. You're, you're not really following God. You, 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 you lie outright on a, on a tax form or something like that. And, and, and it's like a little, small, little cracks. And before you know it, you, you, you're writing that you, 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 all your gas was, was, was a business, and it's not. I know people who do that, who, like, little, little things, and they think it's no big deal, but it is a big deal. Right. I mean, it's it's anything. I mean, it's anything that, you know, I mean, if you, you compromise a little, you'll eventually compromise a lot. You know, because it'll get easier to do it. Listen, we just get, we get jaded. You know, we get jaded. We just, you know, you know, what bothers us a lot now may not bother us so much, you know, down the road. I'm like, well, what's the big deal? Everybody does it. The rule do it. You know, so... All right, any last thoughts? Did everybody meet Natalie, by the way? No. That's Natalie. <laughs> All right. Uh, any last uh, questions or comments before Derek closes us in prayer? Well, I just want to, I guess I had a quick question. When it says that, um, like, in the beginning of Judges, and um, they asked the Lord, and then he said to them, was that, like, the casting of lots? Like, like were they doing that to hear from him, or was he, like, all oh, the I'm sorry. So, so I mean, how were they hearing from him? Yeah, was it audible? Was, was they might have like been a prophet. Were, yeah, they might I mean, have been a prophet. I mean, priest, prophet. They they did something called casting lots, which was throughout all the Old Testament, but wasn't wasn't throwing dice. I mean, it was seeking the will of God. Um, you know, and I think I said it when I preached on um 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 Matthias, the, the Acts two. Yeah. The, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Matthias. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's the last time we see it done because now the Spirit of God comes and we don't need, and we know the will of God 
either in his word or, 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 or clearly by the alignment of the spirit. And, and a lot of times in the Old Testament, they would have a prophet. So when they say they sought the Lord, they actually went to a priest or to a prophet. Sometimes they don't name who it is. But it's not, we forget our privilege we have today when we can go before God, but they couldn't do that. They would actually go to a holy person or a prophet who spoke for, yeah. the God, for God. And, and remember for, you know, five, six, gener five, six decades, you had, you had Moses and Joshua who, mm. who were clearly <coughs> bringing the word of God. Yvette on Facebook says, hi, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> Yvette's moving in a week. <laughs> Is that it? That's it, yeah. No, no questions no, tonight. No. Nothing, from, nothing from Jim Gavigan? Nothing, yeah. Ask him to write something. Jim, we need a question All right. if you're out there. All right, well, you can ask it. We can answer it after Derek plays. Well, guys, thank you very much. Derek, and his refreshments and stuff, please grab.